Today, the legendary 100th Infantry Battalion is the only infantry unit in the United States Army Reserve. Being one of a kind is nothing new for the 100th. From its roots as the racially segregated Hawaiian Provisional Infantry Battalion to today, join a special insights conversation about how the Orphan Battalion, one Puka Puka, transformed Hawaii and our country. Tonight's special live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Tonight, tonight, PBS Hawaii continues to put a spotlight on the stories of how our community was affected in profound ways by the events of December 7, 1941. Formed during World War II, the 100th Infantry Battalion, nicknamed One Puka Puka, was initially made up largely of Nisei, second generation Japanese Americans from Hawaii. The unit represented the first group of Japanese Americans sent into combat during World War II after initially being banned from serving in the U.S. military. Their military successes and sacrifices came with numerous casualties, but paved the way for large-scale participation in the war effort by Japanese American soldiers. The 100th eventually became a part of the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team, also comprised of Nisei troops seeing combat in Europe and Africa. The nation's highest award for combat, the Medal of Honor, was awarded to 21 members of the 100th for their service in World War II. Members of the 100th served in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, and the battalion was also deployed to Kuwait and Iraq. Joining us in our studio tonight are historians and veteran service members of the 100th Infantry Battalion to explore the legacy of this highly decorated military army unit and its service to our country. We look forward to your participation in our show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest, James Kuroiwa Jr. enlisted and served with the 100th 442nd Infantry Battalion from 1964 through 1971. He volunteered for duty in Vietnam and served as a mortar section leader. He's a founding member of the Go For Broke National Education Center and has served on the board of directors of the Go For Broke Association since 1985. Miguel Baez transferred from active duty to the 100th Infantry Battalion in 1997. He is currently a sergeant major in the 303rd Maneuver Enhancement Brigade. He works as a full-time water safety officer on the leeward coast of Oahu. Mark Matsunaga is a lifelong resident of Hawaii and the son of a military intelligence service veteran of World War II. He was a reporter and editor with the Honolulu Advertiser for 20 years and KHON TV News Managing Editor for eight years. He later was a public affairs officer for the Honolulu Mayor's Office and and the Navy's Pacific Fleet. Now retired, he's a member of the Board of Directors of Pacific Historic Parks and the MIS Veterans Club of Hawaii. And Tom, Tom Kaufman is a writer and filmmaker and the former chief political reporter for the Honolulu Star Bulletin from 1968 to 1973. He is currently writing a two-volume book, The Movement for Equality, in which he explores how the events of World War II have played a pivotal role in our community. Mr. Kaufman's film, Gun Ganbare, Don't Give Up, and First Battle, The Battle for Equality, both feature the Japanese-American experience in Hawaii during World War II. And I think that's a great place to start. Welcome all of you tonight. What is the Japanese-American experience in the days immediately following December 7th, 1941? Immediately following uh, was a period of shock, I think, uh, profound shock and uh, dismay, and uh, thereafter a kind of, you know, uh, attempt to, you know, either pull yourself together or help others pull themselves together and cope, get going, and, uh, and also to focus on tasks at hand. And uh, it was against a leadership call to really get involved in the war effort and in the process of being involved in the war effort to fight down the uh, tremendous anti-Japanese 
reaction that went on in response to Pearl Harbor. In the wake of that kind of an environment, Mark, jump in on this. Um, where do we see the 100th forming? Where, where does this, this unit begin? Yeah, a lot of people don't understand or <laughs> didn't know that um, the United States had resumed or had started a peacetime draft for the very first time in its history a year before Pearl Harbor. And they uh, federalized nat uh, National Guard units here, 298th, 299th Infantry, um, part of the, the Hawaiian Department pre-war. Um, so, you know, Japanese were almost 40% of the territory's population. So, you know, large numbers of them were, were drafted into the 298th and 299th. Um, so on December 7th, for example, you had Japanese American and every other kind of soldiers guarding the beaches. Um, you know, I think they helped capture like the very first POW the next day in Waimanalo. Um, and, you know, faithfully serving. One of the, the December 7th casualties was, was an AJA guy, uh, Torao Migita, who was on his, it was Sunday, so he was on it, he had heard about the attack and was, was heeding the call for people who were off duty to report to their units and he, he, was, he was killed. Um, so these guys served faithfully um, by May of, yeah, six months later, uh, you know, Japan had won a string of victories throughout the Pacific. Uh, Navy code breakers knew that something was coming up at Midway, it was gonna be a big battle. Uh, for a couple of reasons, the, the Army decided we don't wanna have these guys in uniform looking like the enemy with guns roaming around Hawaii if Japan's gonna get a foothold in Midway and invade the islands. So they shipped them out very quietly, took them out of their units. June 5th, in the middle of the, the three-day Battle of Midway, sent them to the mainland and they became the 100th Battalion. Yeah. That's an amazing history. <laughs> when, when do we see the 100th and the 442nd come together? How does that happen? Actually, it's really interesting. Uh, I was involved in the Congressional Gold Medal Project at, uh, as, as a member of the uh, uh, National Veterans Network. And uh, I wasn't really involved in the history until getting involved with the uh, Congressional Gold Medal. In fact, I found out that one of my neighbors uh, well, was drafted with the 100, and, uh, and we became friends, but this was way after he served at the, with the 100. <clears throat> now the, the situation was quite interesting. The 100 went over early, and uh, they went to Fort McCoy, and then later on to uh, Camp Shelby. Uh, to uh, for their training and uh, left early for Europe and South Africa and uh, uh, North Africa to uh, begin the, uh, their, their fighting. So they were there some seven to nine months before the 442nd came over. The interesting part is that when the, the 100th Battalion went to Shelby, that's when they formed the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and they were also at Shelby, where the two units had met. And uh, they were still separate, because uh, the, the uh, 442nd still had the 1st, 2nd, and the 3rd Battalion, plus all the other uh, units. So the uh, 100 get shipped out to, to North Africa. They begin fighting. They, they, they're in combat for about nine months. During that period, there's a lot of casualties that the 100 was taking. And what, what happened was that uh, there were a lot of trainees from the 442nd. As the uh, uh, casualties were taking place, the replacements came from the 442nd. So you had some hybrid soldiers, the original 100th Battalion, uh, together with the 442nd. And slowly the two units kind of uh, merged. Eventually what the Army did was uh, they sent the 442nd over to uh, Europe and the 1st Battalion was left back at Shelby, and they became the, the 171st Training Battalion to train other uh, volunteers that were coming through. And the 100th Infantry Battalion separate became the 1st Battalion of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. 
and that's when the history of the joint started. So, and, and how many men are we talking about in each? Oh, you're talking about uh, you know, a battalion would have about 900 men. And uh, if you, you're talking about the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, there's, there's probably 3,000 in total. The 100th was actually oversized. It was yes. an oversized <laughs> That's battalion. That's right. Yeah, so it was, it started out at about 1,300, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think 14. Yeah. 1,400 even, yeah. Were these identities, you know, when we, when we talk about the 100th and the 442nd, you know, um, I think for those of us who are not that familiar with the history, we tend to kind of lump them together. Mm -hmm. um, how, how are their identities different? For us, uh, my generation, because I'm a Vietnam vet, I look at it, uh, there's no difference. The 100, 442nd uh, is one and the same. Uh, it's it's Quite interesting. Maybe, maybe my experience uh, in uh, Vietnam kind of showed that the uh, legacy of the 100 and the 442nd of being American showed up in Korea and really showed up in uh, in Vietnam because I had uh, I was a section leader and I had uh, some 24 men from all over the United States. They were part of my section. All ethnic groups all different religions, but we all operated as a one unit. And it was interesting, <laughs> we had a uh, <laughs> get together after dinner one, one evening and we were just shooting the bull and you always do that in the military. And uh, the, the discussion came out, it says, you know, when some, one of us get wounded, everybody helps. And it says, uh, why does that happen? And Johnny Green, black, Louisiana, says, look, you guys, we all bleed red. We're all same, we're all Americans. And they always say, exactly. And it's uh, really interesting when you see this uh, kind of uh, interchange taking place. And I look at it and it says, what the 100, 442 did, and what their, their legacy is, is we are Americans, American first. Miguel, tell me about the reputation of the 100th today. It's a big legacy. It's been around for many years. Um, just the uh, 442nd itself and the 100th Battalion all together. Um, it's a big uh, legacy we have to uphold as new members join the unit in itself. Um, they, uh, it's kind of hard to say, but it's like they basically, that legacy, it's like, it's like having Big Brother on your shoulders and having to carry that legacy. It's, it's a big, it's a burden <laughs> in a way and a big shoe to fill, but uh, we try our best to uphold the legacy. Yeah, it's certainly a lot, a lot to live up to. Tom, jump in here. Tell me about, you know, when we talk about this legacy and the men who were first in the battalion, um, this is a reservist unit. So these are people who are volunteers to start. Tell us about sort of how they all come together and, and and, and sort of how this all forms. Okay, well, I go back to Mark's uh, point that the United States government passed its first peacetime draft law uh, in 1939, and then it was implemented in Hawaii in 1940. Um, so these were not volunteers in that sense. They were draftees. Mm. And it... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't disagree with, uh, I agree with the spirit of, of what Jimmy said, but you know, the, the fact was that the uh, 100th was made up largely of draftees uh, at where the 442nd would, in its initial form and sort of breathtaking form was made up of this mass outpouring of volunteers. I mean, that's a huge difference. <clears throat> it, it was a, uh, uh, a difference in origin, um, and it made a real difference in the, the way that history developed, because these units are, you know, kind of uh, uh, all connected in a progression of events. But the 100th is, uh, you know, pioneering in terms of regular army, and. Um, they were, um, you know, uniquely 
uh, shrouded in um, ambiguous circumstances to which Mark alluded. It's like, are, they, are we being shipped to a concentration camp or are we being shipped to a military training camp? Um, the, the reality was that there was never any real question, but it wasn't clear to them um, that they were an absolutely crucial experiment of the United States Army and the martial law government of Hawaii with a lot of pushing from the Hawaii community to f take, to lift a Japanese American unit out of the uh, Federal Reserves, because that was, those were multiracial units. So they lifted basically the 1,400 Japanese Americans and formed a discrete unit. And then that discrete unit is under intense scrutiny from that moment on, you know. Mark, talk about when we, you know, building on what Tom is saying, when we think about these these folks being drafted, and, and, and you know, when we think about the 442, you know, you, we think about Daniel Inouye and rushing in to sign up and to sort of prove your loyalty to your country by enlisting immediately. Um, these guys are in a different circumstance. <coughs> Sort of, but keep in mind that generally they were a few years older than, than the Danny Noy guys, and, uh, the folks who volunteered for the 442nd. I mean, they were like, when they were drafted, uh, it was supposed to be for one year, except Pearl Harbor happened. In fact, there was a good friend of mine, her father uh, was drafted, was supposed to get out of, the, of active duty on December 8, 1941. And instead, you know, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, and he does the next four years, fights all the way through Europe. Um, so a little bit different, and it, there's some bureaucratic differences too. After Pearl Harbor, early 1942, the selective service system reclassifies Japanese Americans and says, uh, could, you know, enemy classified on 4C, enemy alien, not mm -hmm. eligible for draft. The only way, if you're Japanese American, to get into uniform, and you know, there are a lot of guys who tried to sign up after Pearl Harbor, just like every other American. The Navy wouldn't take, the sea services wouldn't take them. Navy, Marine Corps, Army Air Force, uh, there's one exception, Ben Kuroki, who was like kind of famous guy. Yep. Um, only the Army would take them, okay? Um, the 100th is over there, there's not much need initially for more Japanese soldiers, Japanese American soldiers, except in the fall, uh, winter of 1942, the, the very secret operation to develop language specialists, intelligence specialists who spoke the enemy's language, which at the time was called the most difficult language in the world. Um, eventually, you know, the, the very first batch of um, MIS guys actually went, um, started training before Pearl Harbor, finished in May. In December 42, they need more candidates, so they, they took 60 guys from the 100th at Camp McCoy, uh, and you know they were all Hawaii guys, and they went out to do great things. That group was called Senpai Gumi, uh, kind of like the pioneers or the trailblazers. The commandant of the MIS uh, school at Camp Savage wrote back to the hunt, Colonel Turner at the 100th saying, hey, these guys are great. They're all, they're good soldiers. The, 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 the sharpness on our posts increased tremendously when these 60 guys arrived. Um, you know, some of them, you'll hear about like Kazuo Yamani did amazing things as an intelligence analyst. Um, guy Hoichi Kubo, another one of the 60, received the Distinguished Service Cross on Saipan. Another one, uh, Terry Mizutari, was killed in New Guinea, got the Silver Star. Um, keep in mind, very important that these were all guys from Hawaii, the initial 100th Battalion. As Jimmy was saying, it, later on they got replacements from the volunteers in the 442nd. The 100th is training away, they send some guys to MIS, 
19, early 43 was when the War Department finally authorized creation of a larger segregated unit. And for those who don't know, keep in mind that the military was racially segregated back then. Okay, it wasn't until after the war that it was desegregated. Especially if you're Japanese, they were gonna, they were only gonna trust you under very carefully monitored, cir monitored circumstances. One of, one of the like most obscure uh, origin stories, but I think it's a really important origin story, is that the community in Hawaii, meaning Japanese and non-Japanese, uh, by and large wanted a non-segregated mobilization of Japanese Americans. And this is validated in the archives by uh, quick samplings of opinion that were taken by the morale section of the martial law government. Uh, they went around and they talked to a lot of people and there were, uh, there was a real dismay among Japanese Americans and also their parents who were mainly uh, aliens uh, because they were afraid they were being excluded. They were being, you know, herded into a, a segregated situation and singled out. The important point is that if people in Hawaii had had their say, if it had really been like a, uh, a local National Guard unit or something, they would have been mobilized on a multiracial basis. But it was the United States government which specifically wanted to form segregated units to maintain segregation within the military, number one. Number two, um, there was the beginnings of a notion that um, to have a Japanese American unit would be a really strong public relations move on the part of the United States government to focus on the idea that Japanese Americans supported the war against the Axis powers. Germany, Japan, Italy. And yeah, well, that came later. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention on the, you know, this thing, December 7th, um, that morning, the Hawaii Territorial Guard was called to arms. The Territorial Guard had been formed a few months before Pearl Harbor to take the place of the National Guard units that, that had been it. federalized. So, what, 300 and something members of the Territorial Guard were, were Japanese. ROTC students from the University of Hawaii. Okay, these guys, you know, Tetsukiyama was one of them, but there are like many. Um, they got their 1903 Springfield bolt action rifles from the UH Armory, five rounds, and were told to like go dig slit trenches at the bottom of St. Louis Heights because there was a, there were rumors that Japanese paratroopers were gonna land there. Big fear of invasion at the time. Those guys served faithfully and January 19th, 1942, six weeks after Pearl Harbor, they're called, um, they're awakened in the middle of the night, told to form up, get in formation, and they announced, hey, all you Nisei boys, get on the trucks there. We're done with you. And they, they, they took them away, they, they discharged them. And what kind of information were they given at the time about what was happening? Pretty obvious, like, hey, <laughs> only the Buddha heads are going. Like, and they reformed the guard without them. But, but the, sto the story of their demobilization became such a powerful story that was yeah. repeated and it's like repeated in all sorts of media, including my own films, that it obscured the important fact that there were still 1,400 Japanese Americans uh -huh. in the federal guards who were basically around the perimeters of you know, strategically. Mm -hmm. Kauai was strategic because it was closest to Japan, for one thing. Oahu and, you know, less so they're strung out across the islands. But they're there and they're constantly serving um, very capably and, and, and with devotion. And when the United States government came around to the decision to form a unit they were like available, you know. And I think it, I think the territorial guard story is so powerful 
because of the intense disappointment that those guys experience, that it kind of confuses things. But it's nonetheless important to untangle these unit histories. Yeah. And the reason is that it reveals all the deep feelings and the ambiguities that went on. So like these people who were so famously demobilized were regrouped in Varsity Victory Volunteers and they did become the core of the 442nd. Yep. Yep. And then they did form up with the 100. So everything, all, all, all the streams ran together eventually, but uh, it, was, it was a very tangled history and the, a lot of the tangling resulted from policy that was imposed from Washington, D.C the War Department. You know, as a soldier in, in the unit at that time, and I'm sure that you've had an opportunity to talk to many of the, the, the men who were there, um, what was the burden of that, knowing that, you know, you were being watched, you were being told to, you, your loyalty was being tested? <laughs> it's a really interesting story. I had an opportunity to talk to a number of hundred battalion guys. Uh, we were sitting around a table and just talking. And one of the guys asked us, says, uh, Jimmy, you serve in combat? I said, yes. What unit? 101st. That was the first of the old He said, oh, good. You're just like us. You understand. And at the time, it didn't <laughs> dawn on me what he was trying to get at. But uh, they had some uh, very intense experiences. And it was, I guess it would, uh, and, uh, like even myself now after Vietnam, it was very difficult to discuss different kind of uh, situations with others that you may not understand or uh, uh, may not grasp what the whole thing was about. One of them, I'll share this story. This is uh, my uncle, is uh, Tsugio Hashi. He was a uh, first lieutenant on Pak Chop Hill. And he never talked about his experience or anything like that. My aunt passed away. And this was uh, years later, and then uh, at the funeral, <clears throat> I'm sitting down, and uh, he comes over, and he says, Junior, I, I got to talk to you. He says, uh, what about? He says, uh, he brings his uh, grandson. He says, my grandson don't know what I did in Korea, so I'm going to explain to you because you understand after, after Vietnam. And he started explaining all the little details. I said, Uncle, I said, you know what you're doing? You're putting a tremendous burden on my shoulders. <laughs> now you've passed on all this information that you have on to me. And he says, but you got to do it. I said, you're the eldest boy of the family. And now that you know, you can share with all the rest. And uh, <laughs> that's the same kind of stories that you hear from the, the original 100 and the 442 and the MIS. And uh, it's uh, quite interesting. One, one uh, experience in Vietnam is as soon as I got there, <clears throat> I walked into the orderly room, first of the old deuce. The command sergeant major looks at me and says, 100 Battalion, 442nd. He said, I, was, uh, I served the 25th, so I know about you guys. And I know you're not going to fail this unit. Just like that. He says, you got the 80, 81 motors. Uh, we, we, it's, uh, it's a four deuce. We're going, we're going to be air mobile. You got to go work with the four deuce motor to make them uh, air mobile. And uh, train the 81s. And that was my job. Just like that, what the, the, the reputation. I think for all the soldiers that come out of the 100 442, you, you run into that kind of a situation where the reputation from the original 100 442 carries on. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a burden, but it's a nice burden that they has at least established some kind of a standard. Yeah. Let, me, let me jump in with, and Mark helped me with the story because you know you're a lot better military historian. but burden of being Japanese American in the 100th. And this was before, you know, any of the positive publicity came out or anything. They're thrown into the beach in, in Northern Italy to open up uh, a seam in the underbelly of 
the axis and the Third Reich, right? In other words, you know, Churchill and Roosevelt were holding off on invading France, invading Europe, and the push was to um, cripple Germany from the Mediterranean. And so there was a tremendous strategic importance to what they were doing. And they became the point unit in much of the push to do that. And they get to, very quickly, get to a, a famous point called the Casino River. Where, Monte Casino, yeah. Huh? Where yeah. they have to cross the river with this, this abbey that looks down on the river, which is a German fort, become a German fort, is totally fortified with all sorts of armament and gunfire. And they have to do it, um, uh, they, they did it at, at partly at night and, and got across the river, climbed the cliffs, and then part of, them, part of the unit had not crossed yet. And the commander said, cross. And everybody who was on the ground said, this is just a pure suicide mission. And there was a move on you know, by, I think it was a Caucasian um, unit level commander said, don't do it. And Sakai Takahashi said, we have to do it. And we have to do it to prove ourselves. And only a very small number ever made it across the river. Wow. Yeah, there was a Rapido River um, <laughs> on the approach to Monte Cassino, 13th yeah. century abbey on top of a, what, 1,500 foot yeah. cliff. cliff. Yeah. Um, that eventually it, it took another three months and six divisions. The 100th was attached to the 34th Infantry Division at the time. Um, yeah, I think to the 133rd Regiment of the 34th Division, um, the Red Bulls. And so at 100th, the old timers still wear the Red Bull patch because the 34th had a lot of really mean fighting in Italy. Um, and after Casino, the 100th led the way, got close to the top, but was driven back. The Germans were really dug in. and. Um, they were so decimated that they were replaced in the line. Read somewhere that they had, you know, between the, the wounds, the, the guys who were killed, and this was in January, February, so a lot of trench foot. These guys are going through the river freezing, okay? After that campaign or that battle, there were like 500 of the 1,300 guys were left. The original 1,300, there were only 500 left, and that's why they started bringing in. Replacements. Wow. I want to bring the audience in. We're getting some questions, and we do welcome you to call or tweet your questions in tonight. Um, and Mark, this is a, you're in a, in a right place to answer this. Um, how were the 442 and the 100th received by, in Europe by the Allied troops? Um, I think, well, the 34th really liked the 100th. Okay, so the 100th kind of made a reputation for these uh, Japanese American, I mean, you know, the newspaper headlines at the time called them Jap Yanks. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, they set like the any young men, yeah, there are going to be people who are going to test you. Mm -hmm. um, once they find out, like, okay, you know, we need to respect this guy because he, we're going to fight, or they've already proven themselves in battle, then they're pretty well received. You know, the movie, the Van Johnson movie that came out in 1951, Go For Broke, about the 442nd and the rescue of the Lost Battalion, which the 100th participated in too, um, you know, it, 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 it kind of paints the whole sociological picture. You, initially, you got people saying, yeah, yeah, uh, what are we doing fighting with Japs on our side, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, afterwards, uh, I don't think you heard, in fact, There'd be people toward the end of the war, as people released from the internment camps, started to go back to the West Coast. There were some, some you know, prejudiced people who give them a bad time, vandalize their, their houses and stuff. 
GIs who had served with the 442nd and 100th in Europe started going on speaking tours and writing letters to their, their, their local papers saying, you know, you barfly commandos ain't worth nothing. You know, we're going to protect these guys. And they did. Miguel, I want to bring you in. Uh, we have a viewer writing in to ask, uh, did you, um, were you aware when you joined up of the history of the discrimination of the unit? And do you still feel uh, that there is discrimination uh, in, in the military? Well, when I originally joined uh, back in 1997, I served from 97 to 2002, and then once again uh, from uh, 2006 to 2009. But originally from joining, um, you're supposed to keep the time-honored tradition going and that legacy. And uh, you're pretty much given the history of the four, of 100 Battalion for 42nd Infantry. Um, and that history itself, uh, I learned a lot. I was proud to say that I was a full 42nd soldier in the 100 Battalion. And um, I don't feel like it's evident today that we have um, all that animosity or anything towards that degree of um, just prejudice. But it was very hard for them during that time period. You can only imagine during that time period fighting prejudice and they're proving their loyalty for their country to fight and the way they fought with gallantry, going into those battles, winning those battles. They would sustain a lot of casualties in the process, but they did win a lot of battles too. So we see them as a, as a Nisei group during World War II. At what point are there other, other folks brought in? When does the military fully integrate and does the, um, the sort of face of the battalion, if you will, change? Well, famously, um, the units were repeatedly cited for their bravery by the president. So seven presidential unit citations. And the seventh one was given by President Truman after the war on the uh, White House lawn. I'll let Mark tell that oh, story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it was, it was uh, it's the, the famous pivotal moment when Truman says uh, you have fought the enemy and you have won and now we fight prejudice and um, it was really you know the legacy the, it, it summed up the legacy of the war and the progression of history and Truman himself um, surely influenced heavily by what he observed about the 100th 442nd the MIS by presidential proclamation integrated the armed services in 1948. So like, uh, you know, a brief time later. And I think in the history of the development of the civil rights movement, the integration of the armed forces played a very important role. Huge. Because that's where like a whole bunch of people came together and saw the you know, common human denominator and were expected to perform to a standard. And the standard was, if you have any problems with this, you keep it to yourselves. We are all brothers in service, you know. And um, so I think it was enormously important to the way th things evolved in history. Tell us about your experience. I know that by the time you, you joined the 100th, it is fully integrated. Fully integrated. Uh, maybe I'll start off with uh, something a little bit different, working with that uh, Congressional Gold Medal. I didn't realize that uh, there was a law passed in 1952, the, the McCarran-Arthur the Bill, that allowed uh, the Asians primarily, uh, Chinese and Japanese to become naturalized American citizens. And uh, the, when I found that out, I started looking back. And, uh, <clears throat> my grandmother became a naturalized American citizen in 1960, the same year I graduated from high school. And uh, at that time, it just, we just had a big party and she, you know, give lays and all that. And, and, uh, Never, never thought about it till much later because her three sons, one served at the 442nd, one I mentioned about the Korean War, 
the third one in Vietnam because he made a career in the Air Force. <clears throat> and she wasn't an American citizen. Not until 1960 that that, uh, that happened. And uh, if you go back in history, and I started reading the Densho, and it says 40,000 Issei's, first generation actors, they're, they're the Japanese that became Americans. Way after World War II, and it surprised the heck out of me, but at the same time I says, wow, I said, America is pretty good. They still recognize those kind of things and allow that to happen. Now, coming back to the other one is a uh, uh, experience with the uh, different racial groups within uh, uh, you know, my Vietnam experience. And before I start that, what we're doing with the, the, the Go For Broke Association, we formed in 78, uh, some 10 years after we, our mobilization. But uh, we're starting to take a look at the history, the transition from the World War II generation over to the uh, reserve unit. And the, the, it was a six month or seven month period that the Army made the, uh, because the, the World War II guys came back and then it got deactivated. And then seven months later, they, they formed the reserve or the radio mm -hmm. reserve units. And one of them was uh, 100 442. And the Department of Army, uh, Dif Department of War awarded uh, the responsibility of wearing the patch and of carrying on all the colors, and the seven con uh, presidential unit citations and so forth. And we carry it on today, all the way to the present. But a lot of people don't re recognize that. So what we're trying to do is build that connection all the way through so that people get to understand the 100 442 still exists. Mm -hmm. And you got a whole bunch of people that are serving in the, in the unit that believe the same as a World War II bunch. We're the same. Um, we have a couple of people uh, writing in tonight. Ralph from Kaneohe just wants to share his perspective, saying that his own father served, never talked about his experience, and he appreciates the show and the opportunity to share this part of Hawaii's history. Mark, talk a little bit about how um, the fact that these, are, these men are from Hawaii, what role that plays? Um, yeah, I think that was very important um, not for, for many of the, the the historical reasons, politically, but they were, I, w I wasn't born before the war, but from what I gather, you know, Hawaii society was very different than it is today. Um, you know, um, the economy was stratified, people were like much more, they stuck to their own ethnic group and actually that was there's some evidence that, that that was there was a pattern of the powers that be trying to keep that going. Be, for example, you know, on the sugar plantations back when sugar was king, you had separate ethnic group uh, camps, camps where they lived, and so if the Japanese workers went on strike, the the management went to the Filipinos and broke the strike by giving them temporary raises and vice versa. So they kind of bred uh, some rivalries <laughs> and stuff. But but because of efforts like you know uh, the Hung Wai Chings and a lot of uh, well-intentioned people before the war, they managed to overcome all of that. Um, and in talking to the original 100th guys, you know, Japanese was not that important. Being Japanese was not that important to them. These were all local boys. They were from Hawaii. And that was the biggest identifier label for them. And I think, you know, mm. for you guys now, still, if you, you're if you're from Hawaii in the military, the reputation still reverberates. And um, people treat you with, with added respect. Um, but you also carry the burden where you, you represent a small place um, and you better not screw up. You know, no make shame. That was like yeah. the admonition so many people got when they went. And I was like, you know, when I went, <laughs> same thing. You know. the, the research that I do, 
I find that the uh, leadership that was exerted within the Japanese community was so clear-minded and so strong and their ability to form alliances and to take advantage of take advantage of alliances across racial lines mm -hmm. was a crucial factor and so that's where the mm -hmm. historical figure Hung Wai Ching, the Chinese American man, some say father of the 442, um, Charles Hemingway, for whom Hemingway Hall at the university is named, uh, was godfather to many of these people. Uh, but within, there was such careful thought and organizing and constant recitation of purpose. And for example, in, after the 442 was sent off to training camp, when there was still the sense of the future is up in the air, we don't know what's going to happen next, right? There are a few words of, of casualties coming in from the hundreds from Europe, but that was just the beginning of it. February 1943 was the first Japanese-American conference of, uh, to discuss, to analyze where they had come to, and then to discuss the future. So it was like, here's the conscious pivot point, and the person who was most influential in forming people's thinking, a man named Shigeo Yoshida, who's today pretty well lost in history, said, what we are doing now will determine our status in Hawaii and in the United States in the future. And it will contribute substantially to how minorities are treated by democratic societies throughout the world. Yes, right. And that's evident today that we're a melting pot. Yeah. And so that's that's a Hawaii story. And that's quite that's quite a burden to carry. That you know you, that what you're doing is influencing not just the current moment, but yeah. perhaps generations down the line. That's right. So so then Yoshida ends his talk by saying, "So we must double our efforts, right? <laughs> so therefore, we must double our efforts." Miguel, um, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I want to know, in, in the Army today, in the military today, what is the reputation of the 100th? Uh, not just looking at the history, but the men who are serving currently. The okay, we, got, we have approximately a little bit over 600 soldiers, and uh, it's real diverse right now um, from many different uh, eth uh, backgrounds. We got soldiers in America, Samoa, Guam, and Saipan as well. But mainly a lot of uh, people from here from Hawaii. Oahu. We have uh, small detachments out in uh, the Big Island as well in Maui. And Mark, this question comes directly for you. How are the 100th and 442nd connected to the MIS, Military Intelligence Service? What attention or recognition is being paid to the MIS? I feel like you might have called this one in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> um, um, my dad was MIS. Uh, you know, they uh, after the 442nd call for volunteers in 40, fe, March, February, March of 43, the next call for volunteers was at, uh, in June, and about 300 guys, who, who had, most of whom volunteered for 442 but were rejected, went into the MIS. And then there was another big class in uh, January of 44. So, you know. MIS was very different. wasn't it wasn't one unit. The military intelligence service actually encompassed all of the, the army's uh, intel efforts throughout the war. But uh, the guys who fought against Japan all classified, usually in very small units or detachments, um, and on temporary duty. So there's they didn't have the the infrastructure of bureaucracy to to you know document their achievements. Um, so, you know, the MIS Veterans Club of Hawaii is still trying to, like, learn about these individual stories and to preserve them. I mean, since it's intelligence, I would imagine that a lot of those stories are untold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the youngest guys who served in World War II are, like, early 90s, and most, you know, most of the, their comrades are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a few books, but, you know, you're right. They're gone. The um, 
scale of contribution, uh, the most powerful statement was, was MacArthur's. He said he estimated that the MIS participation in the Pacific War saved a million lives and cut a year off the war. What a legacy. Wow. That's a legacy. What a legacy. Um, uh, that's why it's so important that uh, when we're working on a congressional gold medal, the original bill that was in the House was just 100 battalion for 42nd Infantry and, uh, or the regimental combat team. And uh, that would be a crazy guy from Hawaii says, what about the MIS? <laughs> but the bill had already passed the House and was being considered in the Senate. And it says, uh, because of the importance of this whole issue, it says, well, but what, uh, there's a number of us that believe that, that uh, talk to the Senate, make an amendment, add the MIS. At the same time, talk to the House, say what the Senate is going to mm -hmm. be doing, and as soon as they add that uh, amendment in there, have the House approve it, and then get it to President Obama. And it happened. So that's what the MIS also recognized, was they're part of the 10442, that whole movement that's all part. The 1399, a lot of people don't talk about that, but they were stationed at Schofield Barracks. And my little league coach served in a, a 1399, and he's a baseball player. And uh, I didn't know until this roster came out, I says, wow, his name is there. And I says, you serve in a 1399? They said, yeah. They never talked about it. You know, it's really interesting. But uh, the MIS is, is an integral part in that uh, whole World War II experience. Mark, I, as we're wrapping up, you know, we are 76 years now removed from Pearl Harbor from the attack. I wonder, what do you want people to know about the 100th? Why is it so important for us to understand this history? Again, the emphasis on, on Hawaii. These guys were local guys who, um, you know, the theme for today's Pearl Harbor anniversary was rising to the challenge. These guys had the, the biggest challenge because they looked like the enemy, they were suspect, and they rose to the challenge in spades. If any one of those 1,400 guys had done something stupid like, like shot up his comrades or his officers, I mean, there wouldn't have been a 20 <coughs> second, might not have been an MIS. Um, Hawaii would have become a, might not have become a state, or if so, it would have been much later. It all started with the hundredth. Tom, I'm going to give you the last word tonight. I know this is something that is that is so close to your heart and something you're so passionate about. Why is it important for us as people who are from Hawaii to understand this history? Well, I think that we in Hawaii tend to think of ourselves as islanders and maybe we're not that important. And the reality is that in this pivotal story, Hawaii did play the most central role. The fact Change. that Hawaii had a relatively more supportive community led to the Army being even willing to consider doing this. And that in turn led to the astonishing accomplishments of the Nisei soldier and that in turn rippled across the United States. So I think it's, uh, it's the, the, the bottom line word is Hawaii. That's a wonderful place to end. Thank you so much. And mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. We thank our guest, James Kuroiwa, Jr., a former member of the 100th 442nd Infantry Battalion, Mark Matsunaga, a board director with the MIS Veterans Club of Hawaii, Miguel Baez, Sergeant Major with the 303rd Maneuver Enhancement Brigade, and of course, Tom Kaufman, writer and filmmaker. Stay tuned. Immediately following Insights is the broadcast premiere of Proof of Loyalty, Kazuo Yamane and the Nisei Soldiers of Hawaii. Yamane was a Japanese American from Hawaii who served in the 100th Infantry Battalion during World War II and whose exceptional Japanese language skills helped to shorten the war in the Pacific. It is an amazing film and we do hope you'll stay tuned for that. Next week, right here on Insights, we will review the events and news stories of 2017. I'll be on the panel along with my fellow Insights moderator, Daryl Huff, and we'll be joined by the editor 
editor of the University of Hawaii newspaper Kaleo and a Hiki No student journalist from Sacred Hearts Academy. Beth Ann Koslovich will join us as moderator. Until next time, I'm Yanji Denise for insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.